Hey, Vanessa. Hi, Dekka. So we just had a pretty amazing conversation with somebody who is the person in African-American historic preservation. Yep. It's kind of a big deal that he talked to us at all, Dekka. Like, this was a big deal. It's huge. And not only was he super knowledgeable and an expert in all things preservation, he was also super duper nice. Super nice. That's right, y'all. Today we talked to none other than Brent Legs. If you're in historic preservation or a similar field, you have certainly heard of him. Right. But for those of you who may not know him, Brent is a senior vice president at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And while he has done many amazing things to preserve African-American heritage over his career, As executive director of the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, he's done the pretty extraordinary thing of raising over $80 million for Black heritage organizations. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. (laughs) Well, I first met Brent a few years ago, actually, when he came to Cincinnati and we toured the historic Regal Theater, which was the place for Black entertainment in the West End, which is that historic African-American neighborhood in Cincinnati that we talked about back in season one. Mm -hmm. And you subsequently wrote the National Register nomination for the Regal Theater, too, which is pretty awesome, Deco. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I did. And (laughs) I, I, I feel like I've you know, I've done my part to help save the building. And right. I, I know that it's super important to the community. So I'm I'm was really honored and happy to be involved in that. Um, yeah. It was very yeah. Cool. It, so it was really great to hear Brent reflect back on that experience, that mm-hmm. tour that we had, and mm-hmm. also to get his perspectives on equitable preservation based development. We really learned through the conversation that we had with him that, you know, he's always had business savvy, but he really ended up bringing that mindset into preservation in in a way that I think other people have not been able to accomplish um, Mm. successfully, which I think is so fundamental when we think about how preservation can be a catalyst for more equitable development for communities. Right. I also like that he was just really game for some tough questions. Like yeah. I asked him to tell us what it's like to have conversations about money with wealthy donors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I asked him what it's like for him and his colleagues to make really hard decisions about which organizations get money when so many are so deserving. I also liked how quickly he came up with examples of great organizations that he knows of, that he's worked of, that he's funded, that are doing preservation-based development. So it was a great conversation and we really covered a lot of ground. Me too. I I really enjoyed all the complex layers of the conversation. And I hope, dear listeners, that you do too. Yeah. So let's get right to it. Without further ado, please enjoy our conversation with Brent Legs. Brett, thank you again for being here. This is super incredible. I am personally super excited, and I know Vanessa is as well. Um, our first question for you is pretty simple. Who are you and what do you do? Decca, it is a delight to be on the program today. I consider myself an activist that uses old buildings and historic landscapes to tell new stories about American history. And... I have the good fortune of being able to look to the past to envision a new future that is centered through the lens of equity and racial justice. So it's exciting to to be in a profession and have the opportunity to reimagine its future. So what's your uh, what's your professional landscape look like? I'd say my professional landscape is pretty broad. I don't know that a lot of folks realize that historic preservation isn't just the work of saving an old building and interpreting American history. It's really technical and complex. My academic training is actually in business and in historic preservation. So in many ways, I have this kind of dual kind of focus in my work where I'm looking for new creative models for financing preservation's future, but also looking at the ways, the technical ways that we can protect places and do that in direct collaboration with communities. Right. And you do a lot of that through the National Trust, right? I do. Yeah. So I've been with the National Trust for Historic Preservation for 17 years. And it's so funny when I had my first interview with Wendy Nicholas in the Boston office I remember telling her, I, I think I'll be at the National Trust for five years. So, 
So it's almost turned into two decades. And the National Trust, because we're the nation's leader in historic preservation, has given me a the platform to work at scale and to test and model ideas. And so I'm really grateful to to be working at this level across the, the country. Mm-hmm. So we're definitely going to get into the work you've been doing with National Trust later in the conversation. We're also going to pick up on some of what you already hinted at in terms of the relationship between preservation and business or economic development, because that's a conversation Deck and I have been having a lot. We had a conversation with Liano Varnell, who you know about preservation-based economic development. So we definitely will not leave that stone unturned. But before we go there... I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to your education when you were first learning about what preservation is. You had mentioned that there's this concept that preservation is just about saving historic buildings. So when you were first being trained in preservation, how was it presented to you? What was what did preservation mean when you were first coming up through the academy? All right, so you can imagine that the kind of old form of preservation, which is about two decades ago, that it was focused on architectural integrity and significance. And and I remember when I was kind of soul searching for my professional identity and I had just graduated with an MBA and I thought I discovered my, my career passion when I learned that there was a furniture making program inside the School of Architecture at the University of Kentucky. And so to learn more, I walked inside the halls and I had this random unintentional conversation with the chair of the graduate program in historic preservation with Dr. Dennis Domer. And he told me that I'd be the first African-American to go into the program and that I could make a lot of money using tax credits with real estate development. And, And he made a really compelling case. And a couple months later, I was sitting in class and And I just remember questioning that decision Hmm. when everything being discussed was architectural history, iconic and Gothic columns and, and the different materials uh, used to construct buildings and building techniques. And, and it felt so disconnected from what I, I think I was imagining historic preservation to be. I thought it would be more, people-centered and cultural. What was the name of the professor that you said who was kind of recruiting you? It was Dr. Dennis Domer. Dr. Dennis Domer. So that's also the kind of framing that he gave you in his pitch, I would, I would imagine. I mean, so what, where was the disconnect there? I mean, where was, was he coming from practice and he knew the realities on the ground versus the academy was a bit more removed or what, what was the disconnect? Do you think? I actually don't think there was a disconnect. I I think he was motivated to diversify historic Mm -hmm. preservation. And he saw my potential to be able to support the movement. I didn't realize that, that again, preservation was more expansive than what was being taught in academia and that you can almost set your own path. And what I started to realize, because the moment where it all connected was when I was invited to conduct a statewide inventory of Rosenwald schools in my home state of Kentucky. That's the moment that I realized that historic preservation was also cultural preservation Mm. and that it was as much about people and community as it was about the old buildings and the architectural story that was often being told. So you're saying you you grew up in in Kentucky and and there there was some some black history that you're able to preserve once you got into the pro- program and and you kind of started to, to to work into that. But I'm kind of curious, you know, can you tell me a little bit about that background in in Kentucky and like if you know was there some black history there that you already knew about when you were younger or you know was there anything from your childhood that led you to preservation? Yeah, it's so funny. So. I'm from Paducah, Kentucky, and for some reason, when I was growing up in in Paducah, I thought it was a population of 100,000 people. You know, come to find out, it's you know, it's uh, only about 35,000 <laughs> residents in Paducah, so it's a it's a big small town. And we lived in a middle class black community of of you know homeowners, and and it was just such a beautiful 
childhood, growing up with friends and to be able to explore and, and to be part of that community. Yeah. Uh, the podcast viewers can't see it, but Brent has a big smile on his face <laughs> thinking back on those times. Clearly it was very memorable. It, it, it was. And, but when I started to learn about the black history, I think my first memory is connected to the church. Mm-hmm. Like we went to Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church on the south side of Paducah. And the south side was the historic black neighborhood. And it's so funny. So if I fast forward decades to where I am now, what is so odd is right down the street from Macedonia was this two story white residential building. And I saw it literally every Sunday and every Wednesday at church and had no idea that this place was standing in plain sight with national significance for its association to the Green Book and and that it was a, a place owned by two Black women who were pioneering entrepreneurs that would create you know, the early form of an Airbnb and manage a hotel that would be in part of the social movement in response to a crisis and black travel. That was like right there on the South side. And I think for me, the, when I was in high school, I learned about 8th of August. So our 8th of August is the Juneteenth. And, and, and so years later, I would learn that 8th of August was held at Stuart Nelson Park. And all of these years I would like play in Stuart Nelson Park, be in that park, and I had no idea of the, the richness of black history, a century old history connected to that cultural landscape. So this is kind of a long way of answering your question, which is I knew about black history, but it felt like it was more about the people than the places. And now given my work, I can actually go back to Paducah and discover and see the the fullness of black history and the historic landmarks that still stand. I think we all can really relate to that feeling of uncovering the history through the physical places and feeling this sense of connection and excitement because through that journey, you, I don't know, there's a sense of that you're more grounded in the place where you are. And it, I feel like you were kind of expressing that for you personally. When you go back to Paducah, Kentucky, how do you, do you feel like you can exp- express that? Like, how do you share that knowledge and that sense of connection uh, with others around you? Like, what's the way that you're kind of Mm, spreading, I don't want to say spreading the gospel of Yeah, so what, what's US. beautiful, not only about Paducah, but what I see in communities across the country is that gospel is already alive. So there are all, all kinds of grassroots preservationists in my hometown. And, it, and, and you can imagine that they are so proud of the hometown, you know, mm-hmm. boy that has, has, kind of left and done well and is a a national advocate for the preservation of African American historic places. And so when I go back home, now it's providing technical advice and fundraising advice to to the leaders of Birch Chapel, A&E Church on the South Side, or to the city of Paducah, who's looking for creative ways to tell the story of, of 8th of August at uh, Stuart Nelson Park, or just advising others that are are working on their own projects as a way to ensure that Black history has has permanence in Paducah. So for me, it's a, it's exciting to expand the gospel that already exists. Yeah, I am personally curious about so Paducah, Kentucky is Western Kentucky. It is rural. I mean, you said thirty five thousand people. That's that's a definition of rural. So um, you seem to have learned a little bit more about this strong tie of Black history when you were older. But when you were younger, it sounds like there was I mean, this, this history has been there. So that means that there must have been a nice Black community, a strong Black community present there. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Like what, what was it like growing up? Yeah, so I have a twin brother and a younger sister. And from the age of five, me and my twin 
his name is Ken. And so we played baseball and our whole life in the summertime was baseball practice and, and playing baseball, but the broader community, it was like, we had an amazing group of friends that we still have today. And it was riding our BMX bikes. It was playing Atari when it was first coming out. So kind of revealing my, my age here a little bit. And, and we had just a kind of normal childhood experience where the outdoors and being outside gave us life. And that was where we created our own sense of community. And then I would say it was the black institutions that really shaped who we are today. So it was the church. It was the social clubs. It was the, you know, the organization behind Eighth of August. It was, were those kinds of institutional groups that, that presented role models outside of the house and outside of my parents that still inspire me today. So I want to ask you a question that kind of relates to this idea of being in community um, and passing on history in alternative ways, right? Um, So something that we've been talking about a lot, which is inherent to the project of the Urban Roots podcast, is preserving intangible things, uh, things like stories. This is actually something that has been like my journey doing the podcast. When I first started the podcast and Decca was like, I'm a preservationist and I had a ba- I have a background in architecture and urbanism journalism. So I was like, okay, the podcast is about buildings. We're going to raise awareness around buildings that are going to be knocked down. We're going to save buildings. And that was like, I got, you know, I, I came, marched in with my mission, right? And then as I have been like learning what Decca is doing and how, what the preservation field is and how it's transitioning in a really profound way or, and has been for a while, um, I realized that w- especially when we're focused on histories from African-American folks, folks who have been marginalized historically, the physical artifacts often just aren't there anymore. And if we only focus on the physical, then in a way we're just perpetuating the inequities that mm-hmm. have, have historically happened. And so I've been very um, kind of, my thinking has been transformed about finding the intangible as evidence of what was and, and commemorating what was. So I'd love to hear from you how you think about preserving the intangible elements of of cultural memory uh, and how does that intersect with what preservation is meant to do? Yeah, I appreciate that question. But I also appreciate the the activism around protecting threatened buildings because yeah, so much has been lost. And so Deca, I think back to when we were touring in Cincinnati yeah, and I forget the name of the historic theater, the Regal theater, the Regal theater, the Regal but theater. understanding that it stands as a lone artifact in a neighborhood decimated by urban renewal in the 1970s. Mm-hmm. And it's that kind of poster child for every single urban historic black neighborhood in America that's been uh, impacted by inequitable public policy. So I think it's super important that we advocate and protect the physical evidence of the past, Mm -hmm. but it's also equally important that we connect these physical places or even the places that have been lost, like the spatial context, the land and to be able to connect stories to these places. When I think about intangible, I think kind of holistically. So it's not just stories, but it's food, it's music, it's culture, it's dance, it's it's the way we talk and speak. It's like all of Mm -hmm. the cultural aspects that's part of our our individual and collective identity. And, And I think the real magic happens when intangible heritage is connected to physical places because otherwise it loses meaning if it's not anchored by place that then influences the cultural heritage and memory that is reflected in the way that we look and the way that we connect with one another and the way that we express who we are as an ethnic community. I agree with you so much that since we last 
we not technically last saw each other, but since we last uh, were, were touring the Regal Theater, I wrote the National Register nomination for that building. So um, it was approved by the state. It's going to hopefully be approved uh, by the National Park Service awesome. soon. And, and then tax credit projects and great things will happen. Grants, oppor- great opportunities for the, the Rob Ronia Multicultural Arts Center, who wants to, you know, be the eventual sole owner of that property and make it into an amazing space for black, um, black folks. But, you know, right in writing that nomination, I was, I was really, I felt empowered to make sure that there was like a number of levels of historic significance that were included in there, um, particularly because it is, like not just the last remaining African American theater in the greater Cincinnati region, it also is just one of the only historic buildings and of sorts that is uh, particularly entertainment recreation oriented that still exists in the West End when so much of it has been demolished through the the urban renewal of the highway um, coming through I seventy five and and just destroying like literally you know. 25,000 people were displaced and and thousands of, of buildings demolished for for the highway. And so that being one of the those few remnants there, I, I found that really important. So, you know, it was not just nominating it for African-American history, which is a very big deal, mm-hmm. but and also not just entertainment and recreation, but also that community um, and economic development aspect of it. I think that's really important. And it's kind of you know, in saying that, I think it leads to like this other question of how can preservationists begin to take the intangible into account into their work? Um, you know, and I think that's that's definitely one way that I've found that that's been possible. So I appreciate that example, because in my mind, how do we activate the Association for the Study of African Life and History and that beautiful network of black scholars and academics and train them in, in the kind of technicalities of writing national register nominations so that, one, we can increase African-American representation within our na- nation's inventory of places deemed uh, nationally significant, but also helping developers understand whether you're a social impact small-scale developer or whether you are doing this for revenue-generating purposes or or you know, new creative uses, that there are financial incentives available, but there's a process and that buildings need to be listed on the National Register to access the 20% federal tax credit. I just think it's really cool that you play that important leadership role in the Regal Theater's future. And I'm super excited to see what are the opportunities for some of the vacant parcels around that site to be able to kind of leverage the the reuse strategy for the Regal and to be able to to use that project as a strategy for repairing the harms of of urban renewal and 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 you remember part of our conversation during that visit was my challenge to the city, you know, can they raise a hundred million dollars through public and private investment that would complete the full restoration of five African American sites selected by the black community and to establish endowments to sustain their long-term preservation and and management and to be able to have some equity financing dollars that can stimulate revitalization in historic black neighborhoods. There's two questions in my mind and I think I'll wait on one because you brought up developers and this is something I've thought about a lot in my journalism. I've I did a, a season of a podcast called City of the Future that was where the last season was all about inclusive development and trying to instigate a paradigm shift in development to think about development more inclusively and equitably. However, before but before I get there, I want to just dwell on what you just said, because I think it's really important to note that you're visiting a city and you're offering the city a challenge. And the challenge is think big, get big money, and put resources into this. And and you mentioned earlier, too, that when you go to Paducah, Kentucky, you're, you're helping folks think about how do we fundraise? How do I give you technical assistance? So 
do you feel like your your role in in some ways is to to show people that it's possible that if you have the polit- like the political will i assume to create a, have a bigger vision for what a place could be and to have kind of give them the inspiration to go about fundraising is that like one of the biggest hurdles that people are facing like vision and fundraising yeah. and is that your role to facilitate them to to get there like you could do this from within yeah i i see that being one of one of my responsibilities as a national leader is to help communities think bigger, think bolder, and understand that they are only limited by their willingness to dream and to develop a collaborative model to move towards the implementation of that dream. And so when I'm in cities like when I was in Cincinnati for a keynote, And I had a very influential audience uh, at that meeting and and also in other meetings. And it was an opportunity to say, Cincinnati holds and stewards a beautiful collection of Black heritage sites of national significance. None of them stand in their fullest glory. Why has this city not fully invested in the cultural its own cultural legacy and civic identity, and to do that in the ways that it has honored other histories. And then when you look at the kind of corporate landscape, when you look at the philanthropic capacity of this community, a $100 million challenge didn't seem overly ambitious to me. And what I was really pleased by is that there were many in that audience and, and, and many preservationists that are actively moving towards it. Now, it might take them 10 years, it might take 15 years, but I think this seed of a a big idea to say that Black history matters, that the Black community matters, that we can use historic preservation as a tool for racial healing and reconciliation, but also revitalization and economic development, that is, that's the opportunity. Yeah, that's I mean, that's really one of the biggest reasons why um, we've we've really me and Vanessa have put in a lot of effort to helping really shape urbanist media. We're a new nonprofit, but I mean, so many of the conversations that we've been having, particularly when we went to Atlanta, which was the that was the last time that we saw you um, at the historic African American Neighborhoods and District Summit. Yes, yes. hands Good for job. those who may not remember, um, and which which was you know that was that was a very wonderful event that was actually, you know, that they had received grant funding from the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, which I think um, is uh, that's just goes to show that these these initiatives might not be specific buildings that you put money into, but also the work that's done on the level of having these conversations so that we can grow and change the conversations and the narratives with what preservation is. I, I find that having a number of nonprofits do preservation work in the city. A little, they're doing it a little differently. We're doing it not in the traditional sense of maybe, for example, not necessarily having like an endangered building fund where we are actively going to be putting money into specific endangered buildings all across the board, but more of a endangered buildings for communities of color fund where hopefully like this is this is just like a, a goal that I've been thinking about as we learned that there are buildings that are African American spaces, churches that are historic age and they need they need new roofs and they need access to the the funding to be able to get um, their roof repaired, but cannot necessarily do it because they might not be l- labeled a historic building. So like full disclosure, and this is the power of ed- audio editing, I don't might not actually include this part, but I want to like be honest with you and kind of share Cincinnati is a place where things happen, you know, 10 years plus later it's it's slow to progress and i've been putting in a lot of effort to try to to be that driving force um i, I mean i guess around the time i started urbanist media I, you know brent that i was the black sites researcher for the Cincinnati preservation association mm-hmm. well one of the things that has happened is that they ran out of funding and then my job was over so for me as an african american person historian who in that field i feel bad that i'm just like my my 
my ability and my work is kind of stopped and my connections with the communities and the wor- ways that I've been working with the communities because I didn't want it to end. I've been trying to actively make sure that through my roles as urbanist media, I can continue that, those conversations and reassuring people that I am trying to do that, even though I don't have the resources. Urbanist media does not have the resources of other types of organizations in the city right now. So that's one hurdle that I personally have been having. And I wanted to kind of share that with you as I hope that we can get to to there and, and that your challenge can be something that we are able to fulfill in maybe even 15 years. But um, it but, would be beautiful. Uh, yeah, but, but I, 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 and I do think that, you know, it's, there's a lot of groundwork that's going to have to happen in order to get there. So I hope to be able to be a driving force there. We, we shall see. I'll talk to you in, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, sooner than 15 years from now, but in well, 15 you, years, you we'll know, be brief again. You know what, where to find me. And I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing that story because when I was listening to you talk about this transition, Your visibility and presence and the good work that you contributed at the society has its own legacy, Mm -hmm. but it's really beautiful how the universe in unexpected ways will kind of force us to transition into the next iteration of our work and our passion. And now that you have this beautiful platform to be able to expand your reach beyond where you were at the society and to be able to ignite these kinds of discussions and to position this organization as, as the potential for, for responding to the ongoing preservation needs of the Cincinnati and Ohio community. I just, I just think you are where you are meant to be. Thank you. I feel that way too. I feel good about what I'm doing and and what we're doing here. I also appreciate you, Decca. Keep doing what you're doing. It's important, and I know it, uh, you know it's a struggle. It's Cincinnati a struggle. is uh, has a little bit of a small town mentality sometimes, and so I think it's important to have folks like you come in, Brent, to kickstart them a little bit to make them think bigger, bolder. And I think part of that is yes, like emphasizing to them, hey, you have an extraordinary stock of. African-American cultural sites, A, maybe you should steward and protect them and have that history go forward. But B, I think you said something very important, which is also this historic preservation can be a tool to accelerate economic revitalization. And I want to get into that second half because I think especially when you're having conversations with cities, with developers, you need to have that economic development piece if it's really going to land with them. They have to believe that it's not just the value of historic preservation itself and, or history itself. It has to be has to be linked with as an engine for economic revitalization, which, if done well, if done equitably, could actually help communities that have have been left out of economic development in the past. So I do want to hear because from the beginning you've said that you've kind of married your business mm-hmm. mind with preservation. So would you mind talking a little bit about the idea of preservation based? economic development um, and how it can empower people on the ground. Yeah. So the way that I think about preservation economics is we understand that there is a preservation economy. When I just think about all of the investment that we've directed in creating new jobs or supporting capital projects or programming interpretation, it's funding consultants and contractors and organizations. And so that's the preservation economy piece of this that is deeply rooted in kind of macro economics. But at the local level, the big need is to identify small scale social impact entrepreneurs and developers that are looking to have a positive impact in historic black neighborhoods, but understand that potentially they will have a smaller return on their investment. The reality is that real estate development is market driven. And so to secure the traditional and build a traditional capital stack and secure traditional financing for projects, you often have to reach scale and 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 oftentimes these projects are not compatible in these historic built environments. And so it's 
really trying to identify a different strategy for revitalization. And that's why I think what Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery has done is brilliant and has the potential to be replicated. Could you talk a little bit about that? What, what is he doing in Montgomery? If folks have the opportunity to tour the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, they will have an evocative experience that's rooted in in this kind of art in, intervention. And they're learning about the harmful impacts of lynching. What the Equal Justice Initiative has done beautifully is because of this placemaking and heritage project, they are attracting about 400,000 heritage tourists annually to tour the site and to learn about this history. They've acquired historic buildings on the main street of downtown that they've renovated for their office spaces, for interpretive spaces. And as they've grown over the last couple of years, they have expanded with compatible new construction that is supporting a restaurant and other amenities for the heritage tourists. And they are currently in development for a hotel to support the accommodations. So the beauty of their business model is that they're leveraging heritage and they are the ones that's controlling the, the heritage tourism market. It is, for me, just a beautiful economic development model for a lot of mid-size and major markets. It's Black-led, it's Black-owned, and again, they are the beneficiaries of that substantial investment through heritage tourism. That's a great example. And like this part of the work that we're doing is trying to uncover folks who are doing this work on the ground because I think there's a bit of a, especially in real estate, it's a slow moving and traditional industry and they're not willing to move unless they see other people doing it successfully and maybe not making the, the huge returns that they, they might, but at least seeing some return. Like there needs to be examples before people start copying essentially. So that's part of what we want to do with, with our podcast is highlight people who are doing it, who are experimenting. Um, and I'd be curious if you have another example, maybe that's around adaptive reuse, because that's something we're thinking about a lot in terms of, because preservation doesn't have to be fr freezing a building in time and mm -hmm. not touching it forever, right? Yeah. There can be ways to respectfully adapt a historic building so that it can serve a community need. And I would love to, to know if you've come across some exciting examples that are doing that with a with an equitable kind of development model. Yes. So there is a real estate developer. His name is Jair Lynch, and he's based in Washington, D.C. He entered into a partnership with Howard University, which is one of the premier historically black colleges and universities here in Washington, D.C. And they had underutilized historic buildings, two dormitory buildings. And so he entered into a capitalized lease where he paid them, I think it was 20 or $22 million that they could then invest into their academic mission. He would have a long-term lease of like 99 years. And, and so he redeveloped those two buildings for market rate housing with some affordable housing requirement. And so he was actually kind of, kind of penetrating the broader U Street area real estate market, collaborating with an HBCU. And when he returns the buildings back at the end of the lease, there is a clause that he has to maintain the buildings to a certain standard. So I use this as an example to highlight the ways that Black institutions like HBCUs are collaborating with Black real estate developers to sustain both of their interests and a way to adaptively reuse historic buildings. I, yeah, I definitely think that that incentive alignment is so key when we're thinking about equitable development. It has to both work for the community and the developer. And if if we can figure out models that allow for that, I, I, my hope is that the relationship will cease to be so contentious because, you know, growth can't happen without developers. And then we, if we only say, no, don't build, then we'll never actually have the kind of growth that communities will need to benefit from change in the community. Right. And, and there's then this kind of, uh, kind of crossover here where it's almost like, I, I know that, cause I, I, 
constantly am looking at the, you know, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund website to see what grants are available. <laughs> um, and, and there is an H, you know, BCU component of of the action fund now. Um, so it kind of leads me to want to start asking some questions about the fund. Um, and and in, in, I, I would love to get into that particular um, fund and some of the specific funds or, or kind of sub components um, that are being funded, like HBCUs and churches, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, to kind of start a little bit, you know, how did the fund come into being and what was the impetus behind its creation? My entire career, I've been focused on preserving African-American historic places and doing that in support of the Black community's vision. And so after years, I had developed a case statement and I had this vision of creating a national program. And I had created a, a successful regional program when I was working in our Boston office between 2009 and, and 13. And, but I, I would say that the very first historical event that was inspiration was in 2015 when Mother Emanuel was attacked by white nationalists. And that was that moment where heritage public spaces and racial violence collided in negative and violent ways. And we started having internal conversations about what, what should our response be? What is the role of historic preservation in, in, in contemporary moments like this? And then two years later, it was Charlottesville. And, and it was clear that those events didn't represent our national values, our organizational values. And so it was a moment to dust off that, that case statement and, and to really see if there was potential to create a, a national fund. And we had two motivations. When we heard the white nationalists rallying around the Thomas Jefferson sculpture on the campus of University of Virginia, shouting, you will not replace us. It was clear that they were advocating for a modern form of Jim Crow. And it was clear that we had the opportunity to confront the miseducation of some Americans through historic preservation. And so we envisioned a five year, $25 million campaign to support the preservation of 150 black history sites. And we have, have done this in partnership with an esteemed national advisory council that's co-chaired by Darren Walker, who's the president of the Ford Foundation, acting director, Ms. Felicia Rashad. And thanks to our partnerships like Mellon and Ford and JPB and Lilly and Mackenzie Scott and others, we have raised almost $90 million. We have supported and partnered with more than 200 preservation projects nationwide. And we've established a $14 million endowment to sustain the perpetual leadership of the of the action fund. And this has all happened in our first five years. And I'm just thrilled about the future opportunities for where we can direct and, and grow from here. And I'm also thrilled that even though we are advocating for telling the full history of Black America that's been overlooked and undervalued for decades, we're creating a blueprint for the other underrepresented communities, including the Latino American, Asian American, women, LGBTQ, and Native American, and other affinity groups that will follow in our footprints. And so in my mind, 50 years from now, there will be billion plus dollar investment in America's diverse cultural infrastructure. There will be a new generation of, of black and brown professionals driving social innovation in this profession. And that, that our nation will begin to understand that historic preservation is critically important part of American society. Yeah, I love well, it. Snaps to that. <laughs> we're all we're all on board with that beautiful vision. Uh, I I do I think though the fact that you honed in on the need for a fund I think is very important, right? Because there's a million ways that you could have deployed your skills, your organization's talent. Um, but you kind of honed in on the need to raise money now and in perpetuity. 
And can you talk a little bit about that? Like why, I mean, has fundraising been the, maybe like the missing piece, like the hurdle that has prevented this work from happening? Because it's not like there's been lack of interest on the ground. You talked about all these grassroots preservationists. Did you did you look at your kind of background and your professional and personal experience and think funding is what we need and that's why we need this kind of action fund because otherwise all the great work that's happening is never going to come to fruition? That's exactly it. Like I always knew that the business of preservation was equally as important as preserving place. So you can imagine that a nonprofit organization that owns a historic building they are not only focused on the preservation needs of that building, how to tell its story, how to engage the public through creative programming, and then having paid staff and management to operate the historic site or museum, but they got to fundraise to advance all of that work. And, and it takes a lot of sophistication to be able to do this. So that's why I, when I said in the beginning that preservation is very sophisticated and technical, it's a complex, almost art form to be able to secure the resources that are often philanthropic driven, because unfortunately, whether it's at the local level, state or national, there's not been equitable public financing of mm -hmm. heritage. So we were, we understood that we needed to provide that gap in funding. And so there were two motivations, secure the financial resources to redirect that back into communities and to be intentional about our partnerships with national media to use their platforms to build a national ethic for the preservation of Black history. Let me actually give you this statistic that I think brings the financial need to, to life. When we created our national grant program. So we've invited proposals over the last six grant rounds. We've received almost 4,300 funding proposals requesting almost $500 million. Just to give you another statistic, through our partnership with the Lilly Endowment, who has provided $20 million seed investment for a three-year pilot program that we've created called Preserving Black Churches, and you probably saw the good news where we announced in January, $4 million investment in 35 churches across the nation. When we invited the first round of proposals, we received 1,266 funding proposals requesting $190 million just from black churches. Wow. That's, there's a need, right? That's, that's I think, the need and the fact that these churches, these black churches know that they are only competing with other black churches. That's cool because then if you have a grant out there and you might not get funded this round, do you know that try again, try again. And, and there there are opportunities for funding that will happen and that the, the money is. It's just the fact that there are so many people out there who feel that they are the perfect candidate for this grant. And I'm sure they are. And it's just like, I'm sure the decision of how how that get you know the the ones that are approved. I'm sure that's a really you know it's a bit of a stressful situation for grant reviewers because they're like, oh my god, all these are so are. impactful and so you know and so um, I am kind of curious with the fact that you are finding money to fund these particular endeavors. The conversations that you have with like people maybe at Lilly or Ford. I mean. Are they relatively easy to have now where they're just like, yeah, we see the need. We want to keep funding this. Or, you know, how does that conversation go? I feel like definitely at first it must have been pretty tricky to. Yeah, I want to I would love for you to pull back the curtain of what those conversations are like. Oh, you want me to give away my secrets? <laughs> <laughs> so I they are so organic. I remember when I was having the conversation with Elizabeth Alexander, who is the president of the Mellon Foundation. And this was early on in her tenure and in the life of the Action Fund. And when I was articulating that our motivation is to use historic preservation to reconstruct national identity, she understood what I meant just within that one sentence. It was the opportunity for us to do this big work 
of expanding the American story and building a true national identity that reflects America's full diversity. When we had the recent conversations in the fall of 2021 with the Lilly Endowment, who already has had a, a, a five-year partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Partners for Sacred Places, and they were investing in the broad preservation of churches nationwide. But there was an opportunity to bring a more culturally sensitive preservation approach that was responding to the direct needs of Black churches. And so when they reached out to say, we're thinking about a, a, a fund that's specific to Black churches, what are your thoughts? And so I was advising them and we were thinking through who could be an institutional partner with capacity and the technical expertise to actually manage this scale of, of investment and to secure the impact. And it became clear that it was the action funds opportunity and role to be able to do this. And so we have developed a sophisticated pilot that includes 8.5 million in grant making technical assistance and promotion. We'll have five national preservation projects. Three will be in Alabama. That's in partnership with the Alabama Civil Rights Heritage Sites Consortium Network that we're calling Sites of Civil Rights. And we will lead them through a comprehensive stewardship planning process. And then the two national projects are called sites of social justice. And these are black churches with a legacy that's been impacted by racial violence and civil rights. And we will help them to develop a stewardship plan. And the goal is to have a $10 million fundraising goal at the end of this. So once we complete these stewardship plans, they will be well prepared to make the case for $10 million investment in their preservation project. And then the other component is we're creating new digital content and storytelling to engage the public in the history of Black churches. And I think what is so beautiful about Black churches is they're the oldest institutions and some of the earliest institutions founded by Black people in the United States. And when you look at their, their profound legacy, whether it is from the abolition of slavery and the public education movement to the fight for civil rights and the expansion of voting rights. The black church has helped to interpret the spiritual mandate of American democracy in ways that has benefited black Americans, but has also extended that same benefit to millions of other Americans. These places deserve to be stewarded just like New York City's Trinity Church or DC's National Cathedral. They are of that level of significance. And I'm hopeful that our, our nation will have greater reverence for their contribution. For sure. And Deck and I were actually just recently in Augusta, Kentucky, uh, in a black church there uh, with a Black Church experts, uh, expert, Dr. David Childs. And walking through that space with him was actually a really incredible experience for us um, because we were talking about like what must have been there, how, what the services must have been like, and not just the services, but everything around the services because this would have been the hub of Black life uh, when it was founded in the, I think, I'm going to mess up early 1800s, right, Decca? Uh, yeah, no, yeah. It was early, like just, early, yeah, early, yeah. like 1830s. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just remarkable. And and we were, you know, just walking around in there. I mean, Dr. Child started singing spirituals. Like he was just feeling so connected to the place. And it was a beautiful moment to capture on on tape. And we're so excited to like one day tell that, to tell that story. But um, yeah, but the thing that makes me most excited about that project is that there's a, a group of stewards essentially trying to figure out what could this place become? Like, what is a way to adaptively reuse the structure so that we can now communicate the history to folks and that it can potentially maybe reclaim some of that community activation that it once had? And that's the thing that I think is so exciting to me about the marriage of development and preservation is respectfully 
saving the history and figuring out a way to bring it forward into the future is just yeah something we care about deeply. So we we are involved with this project because we are essentially utilizing our power of of audio to record in the the process of this uh, feature adaptive reuse project. Right right now they're trying to find the money to do it. They're trying to find the um the the, the ideas and the kind of thoughts around what can this space possibly be reused as, but also there is an extraordinary amount of work being done on identifying the history, right? So it's interesting because along, it's one of those, um, one of those Kentucky towns that's along the Ohio River. And so the, 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 the folks from the African-American folks from the, those communities are, really no longer living in that in that town so we're trying to ha- start this this you know entry audio of like you know doing honestly like a bonus episode to sort of be like a call to action like hey you know we are working to uncover these stories and are looking to be able to have these conversations with people who have history here who are from here so it, it's it's kind of an incredible path forward and we're gonna I'm excited to see how our ability to be, be podcasters can really help also drive this economic force and really be also making sure that we're hearing from the people who have connections to these places. Yeah, that's great. We we've funded 185 grantee projects. And again, through the through the action fund, that's only one c- component of our work. Really, our bread and butter are multi-year preservation projects and and preservation advocacy. But we funded projects that are looking at new uses for historic buildings. One is the Palmer Pharmacy Building in Lexington, Kentucky. And it is this really cool mid-century modern building it's kind of like a light blue color. It's, 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 it's pretty cool just, just visually and architecturally. But it was owned by Dr. Palmer, who was the first African-American to hold to be invited to be on the board of trustees at the University of Kentucky. He was an entrepreneur that helped to revitalize a historic black neighborhood in, in Lexington. So the plans are to reuse the building as a kind of center for social services that would be managed by the United Way. Ooh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, which is still, you know, looking to uplift the Black community, which is important. We also invested in a husband and wife. They have a, a, a foundation and they're actively working to preserve the writing cabin of James Weldon Johnson in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And you can imagine it is this simple one room space, vernacular wooden structure. Thankfully, it's still standing and we will support its restoration. But they envision that to continue its historic use as a writing cabin, but to make that available to folks to rent and to be in this really beautiful kind of natural setting and, and landscape, but to be connected to you know, an acclaimed American writer and and creative like James Weldon Johnson. The other example is the El Dorado Ballroom that's in Houston, Texas, associated to the Green Book. And and Project Row Houses is, is going to rehabilitate that building for revenue generating uses to return it back to its former glory as a, a center for arts and culture. But to do this in a way that is actually financially sustainable. Which is key. Uh, so I do want to, we asked you to peel back the curtain a little bit on the fundraising conversations. I'm going to ask another awkward question, which is to peel back the curtain on the decision making. Because like Decca said, like every single person that puts in a proposal to you has something significant. Like there is, there is so much need. There are so many great projects. You cannot fund them all. So how do you make these horrible decisions <laughs> about what to grant funding to? It's hard, as you can imagine, but we have a very intentional and thoughtful seven-month evaluation process. Wow. And we've got phases of, of review, but we're looking for 
diversity of stories and archetypes, geographic diversity. We are looking to prioritize projects that are led by organizations whose primary mission is to interpret Black history through historic preservation. And then we're looking for innovative models that can inform the future of, of preservation. Like one that we funded this past July was uh, connected to artist Faith Ringgold. And so her beloved home that's in, I think, Inglewood, New Jersey, is where she has a home, garden, and studio. Faith Ringgold is living history at the age of 90. She's created an organization and is working with the community to develop a, a long-term stewardship vision for her, her physical legacy and for that site. And we thought it was innovative that someone who's still living is proactively looking towards the long-term interpretation and preservation of their important legacy. And, and this, this connects back to a moment that I will never forget when I was in Chicago and I literally saw the demolition of Oprah Winfrey's studio. Mm. Whoa, really? Yeah. And you can imagine the pain that I felt because I knew that one day it would be a national historic landmark or a national monument and that the world would be touring this to, to never forget her remarkable legacy. But it was being demolished and... And so I instantly thought we have to, as preservations, be more proactive in places of recent history to begin to engage with property owners around a future looking preservation strategy. Because in my mind, we could have held a preservation easement just on the studio and and that could have been incorporated into a new development project that would have retained the physical legacy of, of Oprah's really important contribution in, in media history. Right. Oh, it's so frustrating that people are so short term in their thinking. Like, yeah. why would you do that? <clears throat> no, and I, I hear a lot from people in the cities about city governments are like, well, you should be more proactive about preservation. It's like, well, sometimes like you have to lose things in order to I guess see the that value. Uh, one of the things that kind of comes to mind is so our um, season two, we talked about Madam C.J. Walker and her connection with Indianapolis and like her house in Indianapolis has been demolished. Luckily, Freeman Ransom, who was her lawyer, his house is still there. But th there's a lot that's been lost, particularly through the the for, important to the black community and as well as important to Madam Walker's story. However, one of the properties that I know that you've been a part of helping preserve the Lawaro in upstate New York is um, I think a, a, a big it was, it was a very big Im impactful project that I think helped really kind of continue to shape the way that the National Trust is involved with preserving black black buildings and black spaces. Could you tell us a little bit about your work with that project? Yeah, I'll never forget the very first day that I toured Madam C.J. Walker's Villa Loire in Everington, New York, and the gates opened and the hairs literally stood up on my arms because if you're Black and growing up, you know the names of like five big historical figures. And it's often Dr. King, Madam C.J. Walker, but her important life comes came to life when you actually realize that there's something tangible connected to her story and her accomplishments. So I engaged with Ambassador Harold E. Doley Jr. and his wife, Helena, who formerly owned the property. They owned it for almost 30 years and beautifully restored it. And so Villa Lawaro stands not only in memoriam to Madam C.J. Walker, who literally wrote in her will that she leaves this place to, to black people to be an inspiration, to aspire us to reach our, our greatest potential. Unfortunately, the building had no preservation protections that would protect it in perpetuity. 
to retain the architectural and historical integrity. And so we worked with the property owners, and I'm glad to say today that the National Trust holds its very first preservation easement on an African-American landmark, and it is Madam C.J. Walker's Villa Lawaro. It protects the full exteriors of the property of the home, as well as partial interiors. So it's pretty comprehensive and it ensures that that any future visitor, that they will have the same feeling and sense of authenticity that Madam Walker experienced living there. Is there a possibility for you to explain a little bit of just that what an easement is legality wise for our listeners? Yeah. So a, a preservation easement is the strongest legally binding tool that we have available in preservation to permanently protect historic places. And so we work with our legal department and what we'll do with a, as we're drafting an easement is we're literally identifying within a historic building elements that are of, of significance, like the floor plan, like architectural details, elements in the building that should never be changed. Yet a preservation easement should be flexible enough to accommodate future uses. And one of the most important elements of a preservation easement is you want to make sure that there is some public access and interpretation because we don't want a historic place to be preserved in perpetuity just for the architecture. It is meant to increase public benefit and for the public to be able to have access, whether it's two times a year, hopefully more, so that they're interacting with that history and learning about uh, that historic place. Yeah, and and just just to follow up on that, my, my understanding is that the space is going to be open to Black innovators and entrepreneurs, right? That's going to be its future work, uh, use, which would kind of continue the legacy of Madam Walker, right? That's it, yeah. So the current owners of the property they have the vision to transform it into a center for female entrepreneurship. And I think that's just very appropriate and a beautiful strategy for the reuse of that site. But I'm glad in the last couple of years, we've used preservation easements not only to protect Madam C.J. Walker's Villa Lawaro, but also the James and Mary Heard house here in Washington, D.C., associated to the 1948 U.S. Supreme Court case Heard v. Hodge, and as a result, would end the kind of legal legal covenants in housing. Very catalytic civil rights case of 1948. We also have secured preservation easements for Nina Simone's Chatted Home in Tryon, North Carolina, and other places of, of national significance. They're a really important tool. Amazing. So we're, I know we're running low on time, so I want to ask you two more questions, if that's okay. Thinking back to the beginning of our conversation with academia and the, the ways that perhaps there was some kind of gaps in the knowledge in which they, they were kind of emphasizing maybe the architectural significance and not so much the, the cultural heritage of places and how you have in your professional and practical work brought that to the fore uh, and kind of married the two more. So you're, I know you're also an uh, a pr- adjunct professor, right, of historic preservation at UPenn. So when you're talking to the next generation of preservationists, how are you talking to them about the role of the preservationist? How are you incorporating this, uh, this the importance of cultural heritage as well as architectural significance into into the m- young minds that are going to go forth and actually do the work that you hope to see? Yeah, so I've always had one foot in academia because I felt a sense of social responsibility to train the next generation of preservation practitioners. And as you can imagine, the field still is mainly led by white professionals. And so presently, I'm helping them to understand that historic preservation is a kind of social justice. I'm helping them to understand that the future work will be centered on diverse histories in diverse communities. And so it's training them on how to be intentional and culturally prepared to engage with diverse stakeholders and to understand that 
their charge is to bring their technical skills in service of the community's vision for that community's heritage and history. And so they're playing a very critical support role. And so that's a lot of what the ideas are, are helping them to understand how to be, uh, how to be advocates and champions and to do that with cultural competency. Which will be great. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, when I was in preservation school, I I, I definitely felt that there was some gaps there that I – I think that are now starting to be included more in the in the curriculum. So, yeah, I, that's just that's great. Um, well, my, my last question is what history would you love to see an Urban Roots episode on? Um, like, is there a story that you personally love or think that more people need to know? I mean, obviously, you've shared a couple of them. And uh, but, yeah, I mean, is there one particular anything in particular that you think really needs to be um, put out there that people people should really be aware of? All right. So, you know, that's a hard question because in my head, having learned about so many places, I I could probably give you a list of 100. But I'm going to give you two. But you'll follow up with a list of 100. (laughs) 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 Urban Roots, season five, six, seven, eight. (laughs) Courtesy of Brent Legs. (laughs) So I think the story of Lucille Clifton, who is this acclaimed poet in small circles, but really kind of is underappreciated. And her Baltimore home is currently being preserved by her children. And so it's a really great preservation project that we're calling Family Stewardship. And it's a project that we partnered with the Mellon Foundation to support. So I think elevating Lucille Clifton and her her story. Also kind of building on this kind of arts and culture theme is um, the, and also building on Shirley Ralph's beautiful rendition of the black national anthem at the Super Bowl. In essence, she also was uplifting the legacy of author James Weldon Johnson, who wrote those lyrics And so to be able to introduce the public to his writing cabin in Great Bering, Massachusetts, and the preservation is behind that place. I think those would be two great stories and places to feature. Yeah. And it's plus it's always great to feature musicians and poets because (laughs) the the, the spoken word is a big part of it. So it makes sense. Well, Well, this was such a great conversation. Thank you so much, Brent, for your time. Any last final words, if any uh, any folks are listening who care about these topics as much as we do, any last words you want to you wanna leave them, whether things to be thinking about in their day to day? Yeah, I want to leave them with the idea that I hope they are curious learners. And as they interact in their own communities, you know, just kind of question Why does my city look the way that it does? Why do some neighborhoods look differently than others? And when they tour a historic building important in their community's history, also understand or ask how can they support that organization, whether it's a volunteer to make a donation or some other other contribution, but understand that it takes a lot of work and resources to be able to open places for the the public to consume and experience. And, and so I hope they have greater appreciation for the people behind these preservation projects. Absolutely. And for those who are behind them, keep doing the work, keep trying. Yep. <laughs> yes. It's your call to action, but you know, <laughs> we, 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 are, we are all here. We are here. You can donate to urbanist media, um, <laughs> the urbanist <laughs> podcast, and hopefully we'll get more, more episodes out that can really, you know, shape and change the way we see preservation. But thank you. Thank Brian. you for your thank time. You. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thanks for listening to this Urban Roots episode and many, many thanks to Brent Legs. Your hosts are me, Dalla Hussein Wetzel and Vanessa Quirk. This episode was edited and mixed by Connor Lynch. You can find us on Instagram at Urban Roots Culture or send us an email at urbanrootspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to know more about Urbanist Media, the nonprofit that produces Urban Roots, please visit 
www.urbanismedia.org. And because our podcast is part of that nonprofit, we rely on support from our listeners. So please consider donating to us via PayPal or Venmo at Urbanist Media. Okay, Decca, want to hit the good people with the tagline? Urban Roots, looking back so we can move forward. <laughs>